Welcome to Everyday Torah. My name is Traver. Uh, Gary, we are on a podcast Melchizedek series uh, number 14. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Man, <laughs> you know, what a ride. You know, when I was a kid, I don't think I could count that high. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, well, you know, I was thinking of our expression. Uh, we were talking about Yeshua's endless life last time, and this is feeling like the endless podcast. <laughs> you know, there we go. How, uh, how appropriate. Well, you know, for our listeners, uh, this might be a, a week later for you and I. It is a, a day apart. So uh, mm -hmm. hopefully you got some good sleep sleep and had a nice day yesterday. So uh, anyway, thank you so much. And uh, you know what I know for you is that uh, uh, because Yeshua is number one in your life, uh, you and and uh, your your wife, I mean, this is, all you, this is all you think about. And I'm so grateful to be hanging out with you. So uh, I know you're going right to do here. a little recap from yesterday. I mean, I, I got to tell you, yesterday, the last 10 minutes, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I mean, the whole bracket scenario. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, I'm just yeah. thinking, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it that way before. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, where, where, where would you like to pick up and, and, uh, I do well, uh, I guess probably this will be the recap, uh, uh, that's appropriate because we're going to, uh, finish, uh, Hebrews today. And, uh, and so just to remind everyone uh, who's been following along, because uh, I presume anybody jumping in at this point is probably going to go back anyway. <laughs> yeah, know? let's go back to number yeah. one and start. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the first point that uh, uh, Yeshua uh, had to be qualified. Uh, I'm going to say this on maybe a little different, little different words than I used before, just to get a, the point across, but that it talks about his qualifications and that he was the only one qualified to uh, assume this position of high priest of the order of Melchizedek that's done in the earliest chapters of Hebrews. And then it moves toward talking about in, in chapter two, largely, um, uh, that he had to be perfected. And we had to explain a little bit about what that was all about, right? We had to... Right. Because people can misunderstand that term. So the term means more completed. There was there was an element of completion that was needed for him that was more in the experiential realm that he had to experience humanity. So he could not just be a high priest of a humanity or, over which he had no direct experiential level and what that meant. And, right. and that's really what the thrust of, the, of that perfection was all about. And then we talked about how uh, Paul, and I'll just use Paul as my code word for the author sometimes, uh, Paul uh, had to tell us and show us that uh, that this priesthood was the original priesthood in, in many respects, uh, certainly God's original intent. And, uh, and it be preceded, actually preceded the Levitical priesthood, uh, and thus is superior to it. And, and Paul works this out through this relationship between Melchizedek and Abraham. In other words, when Abraham meets Melchizedek and gives tithes to him, that's saying something very significant. And, uh, and he uses that as the argument to show that, uh, that the, that this priesthood was really God's original intent and it's superior and it, and it's kind of the ultimate priesthood, if you will. Uh, and then last time we talked about the, uh, second covenant, the new covenant, if you will, that term is used in, in Jeremiah. And by the way, the Hebrew word could also mean renewed covenant as well. So new, renewed, you know, it, it sort of depends a little bit on perspective, but we'll just refer to it as the new covenant. That's what, what most people understand. And, um, and how that figures into this whole discussion. And, um, and, and it, and it's important because, uh, uh we, we, we need to understand what a covenant is, and we talked a little bit about that. Uh, it's between two parties, and there's, a, there's an agreement uh, that's made between these parties. And we discussed how what uh, Paul is telling us in chapter 8, uh, particularly, uh, is that the, the reason for the failure of the covenant, the original covenant with Israel and God, was not God, and it wasn't the covenant. <laughs> it wasn't, in other words, the terms of the covenant or the uh, the specifics of the covenant. It was the hearts of the people. That was so the problem. If I might yeah. uh, just catch our listeners up a tiny bit, what Gary is referring to there is Hebrews uh, chapter eight, verses seven and eight, because the text says, "For finding fault with them." Yeah, so, in other words, yes. the covenant between two parties, Yahweh and Israel, the fault was not with the the uh, 
with Yahweh. The fault was not with the terms of mm-hmm. the covenant. The fault was with the people. And then uh, just moving back a tiny bit, uh, when Gary is referring to uh, uh, the Levitical priesthood paying tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek, uh, that would be uh, Hebrews 7, right there in the first uh, uh First five verses, about probably verse five, somewhere around there. So just to kind of get you caught up there. Uh, And then when uh, Gary is talking about uh, uh, the Apostle Paul in relation to Hebrews, uh, this is ongoing thing. We'll have a whole hour on this one. Uh, But uh, Gary is uh, so convinced that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote uh, Hebrews, uh, and he has really a, a good case for this. So uh, don't think the guy's nuts, because <laughs> maybe a little nuts, but not 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 nuts because of that. Uh, I'm a little eccentric. Enigmatic. <laughs> <laughs> going to get going against the grain, I guess. Apparently, yeah. although although there are people others who are beginning to see this as well. You know, yeah, I'm not, it is I'm not, not the a, only one. Definitely, no, you're not. I don't think even in yeah. theological circles, yeah. you're yeah. not out there and no, no. Or anything no. like that. So just want to catch you up there and uh, yeah, continue on. So we got there in chapter eight, uh, a, a, yes. a better covenant, Hebrews eight yeah. thirteen. That's right. Yeah. And then, uh, so we finished chapter eight with that first bracket that you referred to earlier, which is the quotation of Jeremiah 31. And it, and Jeremiah 31 is the, is a statement, one of the clearest statements, and really in some sense, the only detailed statement we have about what the new covenant is and how it was originally given to Israel. It's a, it was a promise given to Israel, but Israel was not able to take hold of it because of their disobedience to God and the rebellion against him. So that that covenant kind of, in a sense, fell on our shoulders uh, as the body of Messiah. And and we're going to be facilitating bringing that covenant to the people of Israel. That's going to be one of the functions and missions of, of the body of Messiah, ultimately. So, see, God's word will prevail, ultimately, because he made this as a promise, a sacred promise, unconditional promise to Israel. This was not contingent on their obedience. <laughs> and that was the point of this covenant. And in fact, that was the point of the whole um, uh, series of events that God brought together in his relationship with Israel uh, was to demonstrate something that was for the benefit of us, for Israel, and ultimately for the world in that day when Yeshua finally comes back to the earth and takes the reins of power. And so it all fits together when you understand the larger picture, you know, Uh, even though it can seem at times you it's a head scratcher when you first encounter some of these things, because you're trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, didn't this come before this? And you just kind of go back and forth and you're trying to work it through. But when the dust settles, then you can see as long as you accept the testimony at face value, if you try to jimmy it, forget it, you're going to be lost. You got to take the text at its word, straight at its word. If you do that, you will be able to figure this out, and it will make sense to you at the so, end of the day. Gary, because I know you're moving on uh, yeah. beyond Hebrews 8. Uh, I've, I've got a little <clears throat> link. I'll put it up here on he- okay. Hebrews 8.13. Uh, but it does say that this old covenant, and we know that in Greek, the word covenant is not in that. Yeah, that's right. Verse, that's right. But yeah. it's implied. It's there. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, we know we know where we are referring to what happened. Certainly in eight, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so that's right. <laughs> it says that the old covenant wow. is going obsolete. Mm-hmm. And so, what I would tell people is that the law is not going obsolete. What's going obsolete is the. Um, the damaged relationship, if you will, mm-hmm. of a broken covenant based yes. on a faulty uh, covenant party, which was yes. Israel. Yes. And what the new covenant does is by the spirit, it takes faulty Israel, us. Yes. I'm going to group us all, all yeah, humanity sure. into that category. Into that category. That's right. Because I they represent us in a real sense of the term. Sure. They're first they represent born, I guess. That's right. Yes, that's right. So what I would describe to people is that the new covenant is a unilateral covenant in Yeshua's blood in that what Yeshua does is uh, Yeshua redeems, um, per- perfects, uh, however you want to describe mm-hmm. this, mm-hmm. is it takes the faulty covenant p- partner and makes her worthy by the Correct. blood of a lamb. Yes. So now we're able to yes. en- engage. By the way, I love that uh, summary. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's right on target. Okay. That's then exactly I just right. want people yeah. to understand yeah. what's being, what's obsolete and going away. <laughs> That's it is correct. not That's the right. Torah. Mm-hmm. What's obsolete is the damaged relationship and the, yes. 
the issue with the people. And yes. now because of the blood of our Messiah, we are made perfect in our Messiah. Yes. Hallelujah. That's right. This is good news. Uh, it is very good news. And the next point, in fact, is what gets a little bit into the details of what you just shared. Okay. When we talk about the structure, because it is here where I introduced that idea of the uh, of the of the brackets. You know, there's the this whole discussion that takes place in chapter nine on through most of chapter 10, good part of chapter 10, uh, is bracketed by this quotation of Jeremiah 31. Now people should think about that. Wait a minute. Yeah, Paul cites it again. And then he clearly transitions into a new topic after that. So okay. you have the topic of the of the uh, chapter A, which is talking about the broken relationship uh, and how that's going to be fixed through the circumcision of the hearts. <clears throat> and um, and so what um, what he then does is he details in chapters nine and ten the the specific aspects that were obsolete that were going to be uh, removed because of their obsolescence, you know, um, essentially immediately. Okay. And we know in the writing of Hebrews that that was, you know, at the, <laughs> if we take the earlier time for the Hebrews writing, uh, which would be placed, let's say in the, uh, the mid sixties AD, this was just prior to the destruction of the temple. I mean, just years prior. Yeah. And so, so see, a lot of that was going to go away in the very near term, in the very near uh, future. And, um, and so it was going to be removed and set aside because the sacrifice of Messiah had made all of that now no longer needed. And it was no longer needed because the reality had come and these other things were just the shadow. And, it, and, and I like to refer to it this way. I like to refer to it as they were kind of the promise in ritual. They were like ritual promises. God made a promise and he was demonstrating through the ritual, I will fulfill this promise. And it's really the fulfillment of the promise of Yom Kippurim, for instance. That's the key because that's the reality, you know. And once that's done, then the promise is fulfilled. We don't need to remind people necessarily that the promise is coming because the promise has already come. And uh, and so this is kind of, I think, the rationale that, that that's involved with this. And so it is significant that not only in these chapters do we find the very things that are at the high point of discussion, although uh, Paul will make reference to a few other things in these chap in this in this section of Hebrews, it is clear that the thrust of his argument is centered on the articles in the temple. And the old, you know, original tabernacle and temples that followed it, and the ritual of Yom Kippurim. And again, I use Yom Kippurim because it is Day of Atonements. There is no Yom Kippur in the Bible. There's none. You'll never find it stated that way. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. being true to the to the text, I'm going to use the term the text uses for the holiday, and and it is important. We we should understand if there's a plural there. We should be thinking about why is it in the plural and not in the singular. So it's uh, it's it, this is the thing that I think is so critical for people to understand. And 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 as a, a way of sort of introducing an idea of proper exegesis, you know, <laughs> when you're uh, trying to unravel and understand and interpret a text, you have to be faithful to the text first and foremost. Uh, you have to avoid the temptation to want to insert your own ideas into the text. You, and, and we all have to do this. I do this all the time. I, I, I look at a text and I, I think about how I think about the text and I say, okay, what am I inserting here? Sure. <laughs> you know, and, and we all have to go through that discipline because if we're not careful, it is very easy to go off into left field, go, out, go astray and, and miss the entire point. And I think because people have been so anxious, almost driven to insert things into this text, they, they want it so bad to say a certain thing. You know, oh, and you know what makes it all yeah, the easier yeah, is yeah. when some of the world's theologians yes. have eisegeted it for yes. you already. Yes, that's correct. And so that's it a, must be right. <clears throat> yes, that's right. Oh. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so that's why I want to I want to sort of put the brakes on that and say, wait a minute. Look carefully at what the text says. It's not generalizing. It's now going to tell you, here is the issue. This is the central point, the central issue in chapters 9 and 10. And this is what I wanted to come back to in this, in, on this point, because we, we didn't have quite enough time to, to get there last time. And so um, 
I just want to let the your audience know that 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 they they need to read this text very carefully. Of course, it helps to have background. So when you're reading it, I'll just warn the the potential uh, uh, expositor <laughs> you know, of this huh? text in the future. You better know what those verses are talking about. You better know exactly what they're talking about. So guess what? You're going to have to dig into Leviticus chapter 16. You're going to have to dig into some of the other Levitical laws and come to a place of understanding so you could better appreciate what the author here in Hebrews is actually doing. And I have been surprised uh, as to how many people, and and I, and I ascribe no malice or, uh, you know, yeah. deception or anything to people. I understand because I've been through it myself. I, I I definitely understand how our understanding of this whole business of sacrifices and temple practices and all these, this is all a mystery to us. It, it is so far removed from our experience, our, our modern day experience that I think even scholars struggle to fully at times comprehend uh, they do. these matters. They really do. You I know, sign and, their text. You know, yes. 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 Have you have you heard the difference between thin and thick description? Uh, no, not that, not in those terms. Yeah. But, so what uh, it basically means is, uh, uh, in um, uh, sociological circles, yeah, I think it's soci- sociology. Uh, thick description is basically understanding what is happening in a text, like a like a, the Levitical laws, mm-hmm. but understanding it from the context of, I know this because I've, I've done it. I, and so mm-hmm. you feel yes, it and you, yes. you emote it. Yes. So what happens is a thin description. It, it's basically, um, you get all the kind of the details, right. But you don't have any substantive context for it. So it, it ends up being really flat. Yes. You know, if I was going to teach someone to ride a bike, uh, you know, you don't really need, I mean, you need the owner's manual in the sense. Yes. Yes. You, you, there's a, there's a feel there uh, mm. and none of these theologians have ridden the bike of the Torah. Right. And right. so what's happened is there, yeah. there, put your foot on this pedal, put your foot on that pedal. That's and right. You go in a forward motion and you, you just, you miss, you miss the wind through your hair and the balance yeah, and sure. all yeah. that stuff. All the kind of nuances yeah. that are involved in this that actually Ultimately, when you sum them all together, they are the experience. <laughs> so it's like a shell. You have the shell, but you don't have the insides. You know, you don't have that that experience. And maybe to some extent, maybe that's what perfection is all about, right? For Yeshua, it was yeah. getting yeah. not just the shell, but that that experience that only can be had. Right. If you have it, <laughs> there's no substitute for it. You have to go through the experience in order to have and it. And in that sense, uh, Gary, we are not front and center uh, watching the Levitical priesthood uh, do these sacrifices. No. And that's even bringing it from our own flock. The yes. best thing that we have is to at least do the feast days observe the laws that we can yes at least gets us kind of in the ballpark where we that's can right feeling no that's exactly right and that, and that and that's good to understand you know nobody's claiming here that we do the whole law it's in fact that's impossible you know It'd be unlawful but, yeah yeah the the point is we enter into what we're given grace to enter in out of a spirit and a heart of willingness because we know it's good for us yeah. To do this. And it's good for others to see us doing it. Yeah. yeah. See, that's the whole point. And that's how we fulfill our mission. That's how we, I believe, are going to fulfill our mission as priests of Melchizedek. Because by doing this, what we're actually doing is not all of the things in the prescriptions of Moses can be done. It's out of context, you know, for today. You know, some of the things, not all of them. Uh, right. There are many things that are still very applicable, but but some of them are not. Now, let's be honest. <laughs> it's just not, you know. No. <clears throat> Pardon me. And so uh, what our mission is, is to draw people to a, to a desire to know him and the way that they can come to better know who their God is, is to understand what he wants us to do how he sees righteousness how does he see justice how does he see service how does he see worship it's his perspective on is is what we're attempting to garner and as you point out 
the reason for doing is exactly what you said. You got to get on the bike and start riding. (laughs) If you don't get on the bike, you will never have the depth of understanding that's required to unlock these more hidden mysteries of the Bible, you know? So, amen. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hear it people. (laughs) This is important. So we'll go on then to the last two points I have for Paul. And this ne- these next two are kind of tied together, but they deal with the issue of sacrifice. And uh, they deal with uh, what I like to call Paul's theology on the insufficiency of the animal sacrifice. That would be the next point. And this mm-hmm. is a big one. I mean, yeah. uh, this is really huge. And, and I don't think many believers understand that our understanding of the sacrificial system, particularly in this regard, you know, what is the true role of the sacrificial system? What were its limitations? It's right here. It's here. And it's only here. I don't know of any other place in the New Testament where this is really addressed. I think that's fair. Yeah. You throw Hebrews out. Guess what? You throw Hebrews out and now you have no biblical basis for any of this stuff. (laughs) That's how important Hebrews is here. And, And so, but what Paul is doing, and because he's addressing the animal sacrifices, mostly from the perspective of the Yom Kippurim ritual. However, there are some comments in here in a few places where he's got to talk, for instance, about the blood. And, and some of the things he's saying about the sacrifices not only applies to Yom Kippurim, but it's true of, of the animal sacrifices in general. And so, if that proviso, yeah, there's a little bit of generalization on the sacrificial issue, but even there, you have to be kind of careful how you understand that because you could draw wrong inferences if you're not careful. Mm. But the, but the focus is clearly on the Yom Kippurim ceremony. And, and we talked about how many, there's like a dozen or more references to Yom Kippurim just in this section. Of, of scripture and uh and the other things come in kind of incidentally so i just wanted to make that clear because as we go on in our discussion uh it could confuse people so okay. i'd like to discuss uh verses 6 to 11 read those first in chapter 9 and uh, this will be our launching point and, and and there's a few things in here that if i had more time i would address that i'm just going to skip over so i just want people to know it's not that i know know they're there believe me i know they're there <laughs> but but and and if and if you ask about it, I'll respond. Okay, so I'll, I'll do it on that basis, just because of our time. But the uh, but the the key thing here, there's a few key things out of this section that that are very germane to our immediate uh, uh, question that I would like to put the attention on. So starting in verse six, it says, "Now when these things had been thus prepared." The priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services, but in the second part. The high priest went alone once per year. Now, right there, Yom Kippurim. That was the only time the high priest could go in to the holiest of all. That's Mm -hmm. what he's talking about. And he went in not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins uh, committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing or... Uh, in this case, I would say that that's a, a translation that would be okay, but I think the intent, as we read further in this verse, is more like, while it still had its first position, it had its position. Uh, that's also an appropriate rendering of the of the of of the of the word there. So that will clarify something because when you say still standing, well, good grief, wasn't it still standing when Hebrews was written? <laughs> or if it wasn't, it had only been just very recently not still standing. <laughs> you right. Know, so what you're saying, referring to no. here is kind of this re- regime change. A yes, bit that's to, right. To Melchizedekian yes, priesthood. that's correct. Okay. And, and we know in one sense, as I mentioned last time, that it, it, it that happened at the resurrection, and yet the temple was not removed, right? Yeah. Allowed to stand. So, so what we're in is we're kind of caught in this in-between period, this transitionary period between approximately 30 AD and 70 AD, where you have both ministrations occurring simultaneously. Okay. So sometimes the wording here can be it can be just a little bit if you're not attuned. And, and especially if, if, it's, if it's talking about the position that the tabernacle occupied as opposed to its little physical standing, which is almost insinuated by this, by the way it's translated here, that can bring confusion. So I'll just, you know, dismiss that issue with that statement. And if we need to follow up, I'm prepared to do so. But, but it, it's a little bit off to the side of what we're trying to 
really nail today. And because of our time, I, I would just sort of prefer to go on this other thread for that okay. reason. Yep. Okay. So um, getting back to where are we? Okay, here we are. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. This is a really an important statement. <laughs> this is a biggie that it, it almost seemed like a, oh yeah, throw away line, <laughs> but no, you better stop. And let's read it again. Offered both gifts and sacrifices, gifts too, not just sacrifices mm -hmm. that are offered, which cannot make him who offered it, who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. This is the key element that now Paul is going to develop, and he's going to come up with something that is really quite profound, quite profound. Fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. And it is here where Paul now will begin to talk more and more about the heavenly sanctuary that Yeshua now occupies. Okay. Okay. So now the key thing that I want to, uh, to put the emphasis on from that passage uh, is what I highlighted and emphasized for you. And I want to uh, draw out some implications of this passage, because what it's actually telling us is there's something in the nature of the sacrifice, that which is, was offered, that was not, if you will, good enough. <laughs> and the question is, well, good enough for what exactly? Because obviously it was good enough for the uh, offer to bring it and to, and God would accept it. And, and, and if they had a petition for God, or if they were seeking cleansing or, you know, the, the, the ritual requirements, in other words, uh, that were involved with this, it was good enough, but it wasn't good enough for the ultimate problem <laughs> that man had. See, it, it lacked and it lacked because the thing being offered was an animal. That's what, that's what the author's telling us here. And, and what about an animal? What, what is the nature of an animal? Well, according to Paul, the nature of the animal is it has no consciousness of sins, as he will explain. He, he intimates it here and he explains it later in chapter 9. So what this means is you're offering an animal that has no concept of sin. And the one offering it has a concept of sin, and it has been, in fact, guilty of violating his own conscience in this manner. Okay, I'm going to be straight up. Uh, I have been one of those glosser overers of this text <laughs> yeah. because I didn't, I didn't put that two and two together on that one. Yes. Uh, yes. So that one's a, a new, a new concept, and I would just want it to, is. I just want to say that. Um, I appreciate how you have uh, bifurcated that because uh, in one of the, another video that I did, I tried to explain some of these concepts and I, I didn't, I didn't mean to, but the way it came off is I made, I guess I made light a bit of the actual sacrifices. Like they did nothing and yes. that's not entirely true. That's correct. And so the uh, responder uh, you know, mm -hmm. down below the video said, mm -hmm. Hey, it's, I don't know if that's entirely true. Uh, there is yes. in the atonement issue uh, when they are coming to make atonement, mm. there is something happening there. Mm. It's just not a, it's just not a, what you're describing here, this perfection that we had Correct. in Yeshua. That's right. But there is a relationship, something that's happening mm -hmm. in the actual sacrifice. And so, yes. you know, I, I had my, yeah, they didn't try to spank my hands, but it was enough no. like, yeah, you're, you're right on that. I admitted it, but how you've described it here is really helpful. I just, I'm, tell, I'm pointing oh, this you. out for the listener, how helpful that is. And you know, the, the term perfect, as we've talked previously, that idea has a, a very close association with the concept of completion. See, in other words, think of it as something has been left undone. It's not that nothing was done but there's aspects left undone. Now it's been done. 
<laughs> yeah, you now know, it's I, been completed. Yeah. I don't. I have, they probably don't uh, relate at all. But I'm I'm thinking about this concept uh, with Matthew five what, seventeen yes. eighteen. Yes, uh-huh. I've come to fulfill. I I came to mm-hmm. fulfill the law. That's right. The completeness. Something's happening in the completeness there. I think it's yes. the the, uh, the Greek is play roo. But you get the idea. Is yes. There's something that's happening in Messiah Yeshua that's completing, making the doneness happen. Yes, that's right. That's exactly right. Telling you, I mean, you get the idea. No, I do, it's good yeah. that I'm getting the idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's right. And 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 these are sometimes, you know, for us as even English speakers, because we're, you know, our terminology, right? We look at a word like complete and perfect. It means something to us that sometimes is close, but not quite the same as it was in the original language. Yeah. And so this is what has to be. And, and I'll tell you, uh, this is why language is so important. And knowing knowing a little bit about the original language is so important because these sort of very subtle nuances that we sort of take for granted. We just read the word in our language and say, well, that's what it says. You know? <laughs> and, and often it does. That's fine. Going that far is perfectly fine in many cases. But there are those cases where it's not. And you have to be attuned and aware. Where is that not okay? <laughs> where is that like missing something that is a very important dimension or aspect to the question? Yeah, you know, I just, sometimes I'll get this question every once in a while. Hey, Trevor, if you had to re- did reduce seminary education down to like one course, one or two courses that you had to take, uh, and uh, they expect, for me, I'm kind of a practical theology yeah. guy, right? Mm-hmm. And I, cause, uh, because Greek and Hebrew, it's, it's kind of more mathematical. It oh, is. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking no, about. No, language is tough, and especially it ancient is. language. Yeah, and I ancient always tell language them, is really I challenging. said, it's not my courses. It's yeah. Hebrew first, and the second yeah. is like it, Greek. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> you know, that's right. And, you know, know, taking a course in each of those, even if you don't, become a fluent speaker. And, and most people don't after one or two courses. Uh, the, the languages are both challenging in their own different ways. But what it does do is it opens up an understanding level that when you go to resources, like a lot of people use Strong's, they use concordances, you know, to, to look up word meanings, which is great beginning. Yeah. But you have to go beyond that ultimately, because you need to understand the structure of the language a little bit. You need to know those nuances in the language that don't come out in the Strong's concordance, yeah. you know. And when you when you learn that, you will be amazed at how much more clearly you see the things in the word. How much just just knowing that and you can get that in a, a good solid semester course, let's say, in, a, in each of those languages, you yep. begin to get that that ability to do that. So, yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I think they're indispensable. <laughs> I would almost like to see them required for everybody to take. <laughs> But yeah, exactly. Everybody. I mean, seriously, yeah, everybody yeah, it needs it, you know. Okay, well, there's so, our little commercial break. No, that's right, Take commercial break. Hebrew. There, yeah. <laughs> so back to our subject then. The, the uh, So we have what's called this, this idea that's introduced that a sacrifice of an inferior kind cannot satisfy the requirements of remitting sins for a superior kind. That's where we're leading to. That's what Paul is going to lead us to in mm. this argument. Uh, and this is important, of course, because otherwise you could conclude that, well, all those mosaic uh, sacrifices uh, would have resolved people of their sins in, in the truest sense of the term, in the, in the most complete sense we can imagine of, of what that would mean. And Paul is saying, no, no, that's not right, because the animal is an inferior. You're not, even, you're not even offering with the animal something that is comparable to yourself, let alone something greater than yourself. That's what Paul is going to drive us to. And in fact, that's the obvious, if you will. I don't think it's really a corollary because I, I can demonstrate, I think that it's really more an if and only if, as the mathematicians would say, you know, when you're tying together two concepts and you want to know what effect does this concept have on this? Does this imply this? Does this imply this? You know, the math a mathematician will say if and only if means A implies B. But B also implies A. In other words, they're tied together so inextricably. They, they like have this, this bound. They're bound together in a way you can't separate them. You know, And, and it's a much stronger relationship logically. <laughs> and, and that's where I feel this is. Because immediately you go, oh, wait a minute. If Paul is saying this, then the obvious conclusion is what sacrifice must be offered? That will be complete, right? That's yeah. the obvious. Well, what do you do then if the animals are, do not satisfy this? What kind of sacrifice do you offer? And 
Now we begin to see the introduction, and Paul's not going to explain it in the in the way that I'm going to explain it, but I'm going to argue that, that this is the essence of what he's going to be getting to now in chapters 9 and 10, is that this sacrifice not only has to be equal to a human being, but it must be much greater. It must be much greater. Why is that? Because if you think about the problem of humanity, you know, humanity's sin goes all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? It goes all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, we know uh, that something significant happened there because in essence, God act, uh, does a sacrifice for humanity himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he kills the animals and gives the skins for, for the, for the Adam and Eve to wear, right? That, that, that's important. That, that little act there is telling us something. Yeah. And, and in the same context, he provide, uh, provides us with a promise. And that promise is there will one day come someone from the seed of the woman <laughs> who will uh, combat the seed of the serpent <laughs> and prevail and will deliver the people from their sins. That's really the essence of the statement in Genesis 3, 15. See, that's given in the third chapter of Genesis, that promise. Yeah. And all the sacrificial system in some ways, uh, from that point to the coming of Messiah, was in a sense, yes, it was a ritual, and it was a foreshadowing, and it was, a, if you will, a, a something that we, we, we did to receive that promise. In other words, there was a promise inherent in these sacrifices. They were acted out so that we would remember the promise. So in everything we did in our interaction with God, even in coming to God to appeal to him for this or for that, the promise was embedded in those sacrifices, I believe, all of them, in different ways, different yeah. aspects, you know. And, uh, and so this is why uh, it's so important then for us to realize, oh, okay, so we had the promise. And, 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 and to your point earlier, these rituals do perform a certain kind of efficacy, if you will. In, in being offered, but they don't address the fundamental issue. Right. <laughs> That's the issue that Paul, yeah. that Paul wants to, to, to talk about here. And so, so having the sacrificial efficacy, if you will, tied to the sacrificial quality, we now have to address, okay, so what is it about Yeshua, the quality of Yeshua that makes this sacrifice have an efficacy that literally knows no bounds. This is really important. And this is what Paul is ultimately driving it. It's boundless. There, there's no way to contain it. You can't limit it. And Paul spends a lot of time, I, I, you know, and especially in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians is kind of a very important book I'm finding out, you know, he talks about the principalities and powers. These are spiritual beings that occupy some sort of position and power uh, that we understand probably to this month, maybe this amount. <laughs> you know, we, we don't understand. It's out there, okay? It's a spiritual reality that's out there. But not only is it important to demonstrate undeniable, uncontestable efficacy for us, Okay. Yeah. To us, we need to know it. But the principalities and powers need to know it. No one can challenge God that he was unrighteous in forgiving our sins. Mm. No one because of the sacrifice of Messiah. See, now that's what I call complete. <laughs> yeah. That's complete. That's perfection. You see, this is what Paul. Is, is driving us to. So uh, in understanding that now, we can begin to uh, go through and understand better some of these other passages, which I'll just read a few of these, uh, because now we focus in on the Yom Kippurim uh, ceremony a little bit more to see how did Yeshua sat, uh, satisfy this, this ceremony. Completely and totally. That's that's the next passage. And then we'll wrap on this and, and, and move on to our next topic. So this, uh, I'm going to take you through uh, 9, about 12 to the end of the chapter, but uh, with some editing, you know, uh, just a little bit of editing. Uh, uh, obviously, the uh, audience is, is 
should should read the whole section through for themselves. Sure. Uh, but we just because of time, I can't talk about every verse, but I'm going to pull verses 21 and 22, the first part out separately, because it addresses the first issue. There are sort of two issues with the Yom Kippurim ceremony. And this becomes obvious when you study the ceremony. There are sort of two things that stand out with it. One is the uh, purification from sin. And the other is the removal of sin. Those two aspects, and that removal, by the way, is really total, not only for the individual, but for the entire community. And, and it's a foreshadowing for there's going to come a point in the future where not only is everyone going to be purified and have their sins removed individually, yeah, but it will be total. It will come on all of humanity. See, this is this is the the idea underlying Yom Kippurim uh, that I think has been has been missed by the Jewish. And okay, Jewish. we got a time out here for a sec. Yeah. You said all of humanity. This is what yeah. everyone's thinking. Yeah. Uh, what do no, you not universalism, and, and I'm using that all in the context of all those who who accept it, all those who are saved. You know. Listener, aren't you glad I stopped to make that clarification? Yeah, <laughs> right now yeah, we got our yeah. we got our mental hiccup <laughs> uh, uh, unhiccuped, and now we can uh, move see. On. Even in the Greek, you can do that, right? You could say all, but you don't mean all. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I had, yeah. I, had to, I had to clarify that. Yeah, that's right. There's a sometimes confusion yeah, that yeah. Yeshua did die for all yeah. humanity. Oh, he did. He did. Yes, but not all humanity will, will receive be, it. Well, that's right. Right. Okay. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And 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 the Greek is rich in that regard, in that it can use all in many different ways in the, in that respect. That's another, by the way, thing people should be aware of. Okay. All does not always mean all <laughs> in the way that you think of all. Well, you know? yeah. There, there's some uh, you know, modern day uh, uh, progressive theologians that are using all in all of humanity, like oh yes, all, yes, all, all, all. and I just oh, no, no, and no. And, 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 and that's uh, not uh, that's not sustainable biblically. No, and no, and no. Uh, uh, some of those theologians are they essentially have lost their voice. Uh, yes. because of such statements and yes. it's incorrect. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm really sorry. Oh, just so you know, we're around uh, 18 minutes left here. Okay. Well, I'll try to get through this for sure. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll do what we can do. Yep. So uh, the uh, verse 21 says, says, then likewise, he sprinkled with blood, both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. Uh, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. Now, this, these two verses are, are kind of set in a context where uh, the background is when the covenant was initially ratified, it was ratified with blood, right? And, um, and, and, and Yom Kippurim also does this as well. It ratifies everything with blood, doesn't it? It actually sprinkles all the, you know, the, the altars, the, the, the elements of the uh, uh, furniture of the temple, the mm. priests have to be sprinkled with blood, the, you, you, everything's sprinkled with blood, right? Uh, and in the initial ratification ceremony, when Israel uh, said, uh, everything God has asked us to do, we will do. We make a covenant with God. See, Israel made a covenant with God. They said, we will do it. Okay. And, and the ratification of that covenant also was with blood. So blood figures into this purification concept, this, this cleansing concept that we've talked about repeatedly in the context of Yom Kippurim. But now I'll go back to 12 and with a little bit of editing, kind of finish this chapter nine with you. Okay. Uh, so, and then, and then make a few comments and, and wrap this segment up. So it's not with the blood of bull, uh, goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. How much more Shall we, how much, pardon me, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, that is very important, without spot, cleanse, now listen to this, mm. cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see, it took something like Messiah Yeshua to do that. The Yom Kippurim ceremony could not do that. You know, that's where it stops short. Yeah. And then it does say from dead works. So yes, this yes. is a good thing to think about where yes. uh, 
we are to do works, mm-hmm. but without Messiah, they're dead. They're dead. But in Messiah, they're undead. Yes. Yes. Not, I hope I said that right. Yes, that's right. In Messiah, they can become undead. That's right. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. See, for this reason, this is the reason. For this reason that yeah. our... Okay, yeah, keep going. I want to interject here. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called, and he's referring to us now, may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So see, this was actually necessary for us to ultimately receive. Now notice, we now get to receive the promise. The promise was already there. How was the promise there? Through the original sacrificial rights and its system. That's where the promises were kept alive. (laughs) See, I don't think people think of it this way. Every time you went to the temple, you were being reminded and keeping alive the promises of God in in Uh, what you were doing. Okay. So, so that promise is kept alive, but see the promise, ultimately the deal has to be sealed (laughs) and think about the problem here for, for God, humanity sinned at the very beginning. So if he was going to address this issue at the beginning, he would have had to have Yeshua sacrificed at the very beginning, (laughs) right after the sin in the garden. Well, that wasn't going to happen, apparently. That wasn't in the plan for that to happen. But he could have Yeshua sacrificed later. In fact, he could have Yeshua sacrificed at any time of his choosing. Why? Because of the quality of what was being sacrificed. Yeah. I'll come back to that point later. But this, see, now you're beginning to say, oh, this answers a lot of questions. What Paul is doing here answers a lot of potential theological conundrums, if you will, that could arise with what he's saying here. Let's continue. Verse 24 now, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest who enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer, now get this, he would have had to then suffer often since the foundation of the world. Do you see? Now, now he's bringing into, oh, all the way back to the beginning. You see, not in fact, you know, according to the standard argument, not only would Messiah as a man have to have suffered at the beginning, he would have to suffer often, continuously <laughs> through history, because men didn't just sin once, they sinned repeatedly, often, continuously. Right. All right. See, that's what he's he's drawing our attention to. But now, once at the end of the ages, and there was this end of the ages is what it's referring to, we believe, actually, is not saying the end days, um, but it's talking about an end of a time period where something of great cosmological significance has occurred. And and that occurred in the death and the resurrection of Messiah. That's the cosmological significant event. It, some people say it's the, the pivot point for all of history, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everything pivots around it. You see, that's what's being, I believe, referenced in this, in this expression. He has appeared to put away sin. Ah, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to bear the sin. That's a little bit of a Isaiah 53 here. Okay. He bears the sins of many. That, that yeah. expression is actually used in Isaiah 53. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. He's apart from sin because he's sinless. He never sinned for salvation, for salvation. That's, that's when he receives us unto himself. And now we are glorified. That's the reference being made there. So we learned some important things. We learned two things of of immense importance in this passage. One is that purification must penetrate deeper than just mere human flesh. It must go all the way to our conscience. See, 
The purification is when it's applied to objects, for instance, we, we read, readily think of it as, oh, yeah, it's just purifying the object. You know, the, right. the external part of the object has come in contact with corruption, so that has to be cleansed. You know, we, we get that in our minds. And in, and in some sense, I guess you could say, in, in some respect, the animal sacrifices, that's what they did for people. They, they could maybe purify the flesh. They could purify us, you know, in some sort of external sense. Uh, which I'm still trying to kind of work out, you know, what the, all that means. But, mm-hmm. but but there's a sense in, in which it penetrates, but it doesn't penetrate all the way. It doesn't get all the way into the very conscience of the human being. It can't because the quality of the sacrifice is not up to the task. It's not sufficient for that purpose. All right. That's what he's saying. And then Paul adds just a, a little while later in, uh, in, in verse uh, four of chapter 10, for it is not possible that the blood of bull and goats could take away sins. And, and I'm reminded of John the Baptist, right? In, in John 129, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes it away. Now, when you take something away, and, 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 the, and the Greek tense and verb use supports this, it's a removal. You're removing it. <laughs> See, there's, there's a sense of removal there. And, and this was also in the Yom Kippurim ceremony. We have the goat that was let out into the wilderness, don't we? And the sins were placed on that goat, and it was cast out away from the congregation, taken out away, where it was never to be seen again. That's the ceremony. Mm-hmm. Wow. It doesn't take a genius to figure out the connection between these two things, these two concepts. It's very clearly referencing uh, this ceremony. And so what Paul is going to do now is, is, is finally sum up this whole process. And he, he goes after verse 4, he goes immediately into uh, Messiah was called. He quotes the psalm, I think it's 40. I, I didn't write it down, but I think it was 40, where he says, I've come to do your will, O God. <laughs> Remember that? And, mm-hmm. and, and, if, and if your uh, viewers will, will read that section, uh, verses, I think it's 5 to 8 in chapter 10. I'm skipping over that for time's sake. but you will see that the Messiah, he was like a man in the ready. He was in a chamber waiting to be called to do a, to do a function. And that function was to accomplish this purpose, to accomplish a sacrifice that was incontestable and would stand for all time. And that he would be able to do that because he was the sinless, perfect person. And he was the word that was with God. And he was the word that was God. Do you understand? You see yeah. where we're going with this. You see, an incontestable sacrifice. And, and he laid himself down for our benefit because he was the only one who could accomplish this task. Uh, I'll tell you, when, what Paul is basically saying here is something that, that would have Probably, really, if, if a Jewish, even a Jewish believer had thought about it, and I think he's writing this because he, he believes the Jewish believers uh, in, in the church in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas needed to hear this because they were so familiar with the sacrificial system. He says later in chapter 10, you guys are being kind of drawn away. Don't fall back. You know, they're, they're being drawn. They're, being, they, 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 they're almost being mesmerized by the temple system. He's saying, now, wait a minute. So you remember. This system was put in place to point to the reality, the realities of Messiah. Do not lose that because that is critical. He says that later in chapter 10. So it's very clear in his argument here, he is making an appeal specifically to the Jewish believers because they have been saturated with the sacrificial system and they need clarity on its limitation. They need to understand, no, this is a good thing. He's not saying it's a terrible thing at all. He said it was a good and necessary thing for its season. But now that the reality has come, don't confuse the shadow with the reality. <laughs> the shadow is important. It points to the reality. And we need to understand better the shadow. But don't confuse it. You know. So he says that later in chapter 10, and he has actually some pretty stern warnings because of where this can lead a person if they go down that track too far. And he talks about the fire that will consume the adversaries, you know. I mean, it's, it's a pretty stern warning that he gives to the Jewish believers, and he's talking to believers here. He's not talking to the unbeliever. 
So uh, I think people should keep this in mind. You have to be very careful with this stuff. This is heady stuff. And you always have to keep it in perspective. So all of this is to say that Yeshua's sacrifice possesses a, a kind of timeless quality that's intrinsically connected with his very divine nature. Because the nature of God is one of timelessness. <laughs> God is outside of space and time. And so what this means then uh, is it, his sacrifice can indeed not just be for the present extended to the future. It can also extend into the past all the way back, mm -hmm. all the way back to the garden. And who knows before if it was necessary. Yeah. <laughs> See, in other words, it didn't matter when Yeshua was sacrificed. What Paul is doing is he's showing because, it, and this is a, a fundamental, what we call ontological argument in philosophy. It, it's, it's an argument that's rooted in our understanding of the nature of something. If the nature of Yeshua is the divine one who is with God from the beginning, with God before the beginning, presumably, with God continuously, as God, whatever that means to people, but we can't deny his divinity. <laughs> All right. That's for sure. You know, I, I, John just doesn't permit it. His, his wording there is just too tight and specific. This will satisfy every conceivable criteria that anyone could put forward <laughs> for total and complete efficacy. In other words, it's a sacrifice that can do what God requires it to do totally and perfectly. This is the point of this entire section. And we see that the apostles, Peter, you know, refer, refers to things in 1 Peter, uh, things that were foreordained before the foundation of the world. And John, in fact, makes explicit, explicit reference in Revelation 13, 8 to uh, the one who was slain from the foundation of the world. Now think about that statement. He was slain from the foundation of the world. Well, what do you mean by that? No, he wasn't. He was slain in around 30 AD. <laughs> yeah. Ah, but John understood what Paul was talking about. He understood very well. He said, no, that just when the historical occurrence occurred. <laughs> well, it does seem to me, I, I, I totally get how you are using this concept. Uh, it, it seems to me that because uh, Yahweh does everything very intentionally. There is a reason that Yeshua uh, died and rose when he did. But uh, in the sense of taking care of the sin issue for all time, that part didn't matter. Yes, yes, that is exactly right. And and so uh, and so it it has uh, implications in both directions, right? What you just said, and also the fact that the one doing this had to be divine. Yeah. And it, and it's and, and and of course, I know for many believers, the divinity of Christ is not a the deity of Christ is not a, a controversy for them. And that's good. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be, you know, yeah. <laughs> but with some it is. And so it you have to address this and, and help people to realize, hey, guys, the issue is bigger than you think. You, you've made it too small. You've made God too small. In, in your in your thinking, you know, God is much bigger than you are. And I always like to tell people, as soon as you construct a box for God, he's blown it to smithereens. <laughs> you cannot put him in a box. You cannot limit his reach, his effect on what he has created. You cannot limit his imagination and the things he proposes to do. As soon as you start doing that, you don't believe in the same God. I know that sounds harsh, but you know what? It's true in a real tangible sense of the term. Yeah. This is the God that's presented in the Bible. So if you're saying no to that, then you're saying no to the revelation of the scripture. I'll finish with this. Okay. So we see right after this section in, in, in verses 19 to 21, which I'll just quickly read. What chapter? Uh, uh, chapter 10 now. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yep, that's okay. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. So this is a nice summary of the entire argument. This is what was accomplished. And uh, so we learn that 
Yeshua vicariously represents each of us in, a, in his advocacy for us before the Father, and thereby ushers us directly into the presence of God, the presence of the Father through his intercession. This is what he's doing now. So he's already operating in this capacity, is what Paul is telling us here. Right. This is our access into the Holy of Holies, located in the heavenly sanctuary. This is our new and living way, which implies, of course, the replacement of the Levitical high priest, though perhaps at the writing of this, the high priest was still functioning, but not for long. <laughs> that, that we can say for sure. Whenever this was written, it was either already had occurred or it was imminently about to occur. The replacement of the Levitical high priest by the Melchizedek high priest. And so if we take this argument to the next level, then to finish, that is, into the very heavenly tabernacle, Paul is revealing that this was the true intent of God from the beginning, from the foundation of the world. He says that explicitly now in 926. We read that. From the beginning, God's promises were concerned with eternity and eternal consequences. And only Yeshua, now the high priest of Melchizedek, can provide the eternal redemption through a better sacrifice, which provides covering for and ultimately complete removal of sin. We see that, by the way, promised where? The complete removal? Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And we'll talk about that further in our next podcast or so. And uh, that the sin is now completely removed. Completely removed. And, um, and that's a day we all await for anxiously. Whether this removal is for an individual, a nation, an entire world, and for all time. Reaching back to the be very beginning and forward to endless eternity. This is the scope of Yeshua's sacrifice. Surely this very striking similarity between the consequential nature of this transcendent sacrifice, what we just described, you know, the nature of a transcendent thing here, right? It transcends everything, <laughs> space, mm -hmm. time, everything, right? Uh, and the divine nature of the one who made it cannot be overlooked, as we've been discussing. The quality of what was sacrificed had to meet the demands required of it. Only Yeshua could do this. And fortunately for all of us, he was willing to do it. This is the summation of the entire argument of Hebrews, I believe, that Paul is laying out. Okay, is this Gary's is a good breaking point here? It is. Okay. Uh, well, you know what I... I uh, look forward to and will probably press. Uh, there, there have been some previous podcasts where you have talked about there's a lot more going on in the universe mm -hmm. uh, that we're that uh, we are not even aware of, mm -hmm. and I wonder how all this plays into uh, the redemption of all that, if mm -hmm. it does play into it at, at all. And then for the listener, you know, when I grew up, there's a sense in which. You know, we didn't need to know about any of this stuff at all. And the reason we don't is because it's all perfected and done in Messiah Yeshua. I believe on Messiah Yeshua, and I just follow Jesus with all that I've got. And I'm going to uh, be in the prayer room, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk to God. And I just yeah. want to say to folks, you know, part of the reason we still walk in the law. Uh, and we're not talking about the sacrificial system here yeah, right. at, mm -hmm. at the moment. What I'm talking about is the reason that we do this is think back to the verse where it talks about our conscience is made clean. And in part, when our conscience is clean, now when we do the mitzvot, when we do yeah. the good work, we're walking in laws that uh, cause us to really enmesh our our the totality of our lives in a story, in yes, something yes, that that's right. It's like you know, in something. If I if I may interject, yeah, yeah, transcendent, transcendent. It brings me into me the transcendent. into the transcendent. Holy yeah. smokes! Yes, you know that's you, the whole point. If you really want to honor this yeah. God that saved you, that's saving you, that will save you, you know, and glorify you at some future point. I mean, we're in this story, and yeah. if we really want to honor this King that died and rose again. Uh, what, what do we give our lives over to? Yeah. What does, and, and I, I really appreciated uh, Gary earlier when you talked about how does God see these things? What does God yeah. 
say is worship? What does Yahweh say is righteousness? And so when we enter into those things, uh, that's where we lift up our Messiah and brings us into, as you say, the transcendent. And this is... And you know what, uh, uh, Trevor? Interject again. I know I can't help myself <laughs> because yeah, you're sparking a, 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 a something deep in my soul uh, in this subject, is, which is when the people see the transcendent in us, oh, they yeah. become aware that there is a transcendent. Hallelujah! Okay. You see what I'm saying? I do. This is I, a whole I, I thing. It. And believers, what they're doing is they're cutting off their nose to spite their face when they reject the tools God has given us. And that's how I look at this. These are tools. These are remarkable tools that can, as you have said, I think very well, you know, they can bring us into that place, right? In our relationship with God, yeah. where we, where we can in principle, if, if we do it rightly, we can, it just, it just, the transcendence emerges from us. <laughs> it, it, it comes out and effortlessly. It comes out effortlessly to people. That was a huge. That's the goal. You know? Yeah, that's a huge message. You want your life to yeah. really affect other people. Yeah. You want to be a witness, an embassy for the kingdom mm-hmm. of Yahweh. Do you really want this? How do we do this? Mm-hmm. We do this stuff. Yeah. yeah. This is why we call it everyday Torah. That's why <laughs> we want to do it every day. Uh, friend, we'll see you next time. Uh-huh.